Hi everyone, we hope you're enjoying Season 5 of Elixir Wizards. Before we get into today's show, we want to make a quick announcement. We're currently looking for an engineering manager to join our team. If you have expertise in React, Elixir, or Ruby, a track record of improving engineering processes, and a proficiency in the design, maintenance, and assessment of technical architecture, we'd love for you to apply. Our team is fully remote in the United States, and first-time managers are encouraged to apply. Head over to smartlogic.io slash jobs to learn more and submit your application. Thanks, and now here's the show. Welcome to Elixir Wizards, a podcast brought to you by SmartLogic, a custom web and mobile development shop based in Baltimore. My name is Justice Eepin, and I'll be your host today. I'm joined by my cryptozoological co-host, Sunday Mint, and my paranormal producer, Eric Ostrich. Oh boy, these are getting really good, y'all. Really good. This season's theme is adopting Elixir, and we're joined today by a couple of very special guests from Legends of Learning, Sean Robinson and Torin Billups. Say hi, y'all. What's going on, guys? What's up, guys? So, first of all, let's uh, uh, let's hand it to Sean. Sean, what is Legends of Learning? So Legends of Learning is a startup company. Uh, we're in our fourth school year, and uh, we're building a platform of curriculum-aligned games for teachers and students. Uh, so far, we have about 2,000 fun and curriculum-aligned games um, in math and science. And uh, they're created to engage students and assist teachers, um, especially with uh, in the wake of COVID with hybrid learning, blended learning, and uh, distance learning models that teachers are now, now using. So. Yeah, ha happy to go into more details about any of those aspects, but that's kind of the high level. Oh, Fun that you yeah. measure your time in um, what did what did you say? School years. I love that. <laughs> yep, school years. A fourth fourth school year. How did you come up with the name Legends of Learning? I know early on. So our our founder's name is Vadim Polakov, and he kind of this was his brainchild. And I know that they played with a couple names. We um, we had the name Smart Little Cookies was one idea. And uh, now that is our staging domain name. So um, if you want to see the next version of the site, you can go there. But yeah, um, yeah. So I think I think Legends of Learning, it just kind of worked. I think our mission is sort of to empower teachers and to really turn them into the superheroes that they are. So we've kind of built our, our brand around that. And so that kind of fits in with Legends of Learning. We will help the teachers become, the, you know, become legends. Give us a little bit of background on you both personally. When did you start at Legends of Learning and what are your roles? Four years ago, when the company was first starting, uh, Vadim had reached out to me on LinkedIn and he kind of pitched me the idea of what he was thinking about building. And he had put together an executive team and they had no tech hires yet. And for me, it was kind of a dream opportunity. It was a completely greenfield project, no legacy code. And uh, I just thought the idea was super cool. So I joined uh, and from there, um, well, first we had to assemble furniture. And then after that, we got our internet connection and then we started coding. <laughs> and uh, we, we kind of built the, the first sort of version of this platform that, that brings together uh, teachers, students, game developers, and uh, some others. So, um, so that's how I got started. And then, yeah, Torin, do you want to talk about uh, when you came in? Yeah, I think I was in 2019, that first, second quarter, April, May timeframe. And uh, yeah, before that, I didn't know of Legends of Learning. Uh, I obviously sought them out specifically because they were hiring for Elixir, which I thought was pretty cool. And you guys always talk on the show about competitive advantage. It definitely was from that standpoint. And my experience was uh, getting to meet Sean and that team specifically because I knew I'd be doing Elixir there. So... So you were seeking an Elixir job, essentially. 110%. It was a really big, risky pivot. Uh, years before that, I had actually been doing Ember.js for many, many years and actually no backend for some time other than Python and just some basic stuff that I was doing. So it was actually a huge career jump for me to kind of throw out all the time I invested in the Ember community and just kind of start over professionally in that sense. Interesting. So I feel like, I think we actually met at the DC Elixir meetup around the time you joined Legends of Learning. I, I kind of remember someone introducing me to you or you to me and saying, this is our new person. They just started and they're joining up. So are you in the DC area currently? No, I actually live in the Midwest and I do remember actually meeting you as well. I flew out, I think, just to kind of spend a couple of weeks uh, on site, which 
maybe sounds weird now in COVID time, but I've been working remote for a number of years. And one of my things that I feel like sets everybody up is that foundation of trust. So when I join a new company, I actually ask if I can be on site for two weeks straight. So I actually just lived there and I was there for a bit. I think I'm trying to remember if that was Sean or Jeremy that was with me and, and did that introduction. But either way, yeah, it was uh, a good time in DC. I haven't been in DC uh, for some time now just because of travel and things, but one day again. Nice. And Sean, where are you located? Uh, right now I'm living in Bend, Oregon. Um, I'm, I grew up in the DC area and I've kind of been there my whole life, but uh, just when, when COVID happened and everyone kind of went remote, um, I, I drove uh, my van, I'm converting this van. So I drove it out here to Oregon where I have some friends uh, who live here and who are also converting a van. So I've been here for a few since September. How's the van project going? It's going great. It's uh, you, you see all the um, nice pictures on Instagram of people living the van life and you're like, I'm going to build a van. And then a year later, you're like crawling on the floor, running wires in a garage and you're not like doing the cool, cool stuff. So that's kind of where I'm at right now. Crawling um, on the floor. Finishing the life. van. Yeah. So now, now I tell people, if you, if you want to live the van life, like buy a van that's already done. <laughs> if you want to build a van, that's definitely a, a fun life challenge. Are you going to integrate any kind of nerves into your van? Oh yeah. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to put, um, I'm going to have a Mac mini that's mounted in the wall and that'll kind of be my work workstation. One of those new M ones. Yeah, I've been running the plumbing and electric lately. And uh, I actually was thinking because I'm a software developer, I, I always draw parallels to software engineering. So I have, I kind of have this idea that I will write a book about how to build a van for software engineers. Cause it's just like a lot of little things. Like, for example, if you put this, if you have three pieces of wood and you want to be able to take them apart, don't put a screw through all three of them. You need the first one to the second one and the second one to the third one. And I was thinking that really relates to, you know, good decoupling in software engineering. You want to keep your interfaces separated. And if you have things calling through, you have modules calling through each other, then it becomes kind of hard to peel apart. So stuff like that. Um, I, I think I would love to to share some of the van experience with. I don't even with have a van, people. but like, take my money, dude. Like, I'm in. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I definitely want to buy your book. <laughs> cool. So I got a couple of customers already for my ebook. Amazing. You heard it here first. So like, start with <laughs> Sean Robinson's new book. Speaking of content creation, Torin, you had a podcast. Have a podcast. Is that true? Yeah. I mean, how many emails did I send you guys self-promotion? It's just like, Hey, I did this talk. I wrote this. I did this. And you guys were like, Torin, would you chill out? This podcast isn't about you. Like, <laughs> my bad. Uh, yeah. My podcast developing fatigue. Uh, it's kind of the human side of programming. A friend of I, mine, Chris Van Houten worked with him some jobs ago. We get together and just kind of talk about our week, talk about certain topics in tech. Uh, it's really not super directed in the third season, which is going on right now. It's a little bit more loose. Um, but it's just kind of a fun podcast to talk about tech. Rock and roll. And there's a story I wanted to ask Sean about, because we heard through the grapevine that you sold a GitHub handle. <laughs> and we had to get this right at the top of the show because people are going to be fascinated by it. So sure. So sort of with one clarification from my legal team. So the handle was at ENV. And uh, I had bought, got it in 2011 or something when I first signed up for Twitter. Um, actually, it was earlier than that because I, uh, I remember GitHub uh, Barack or Obama followed. It was Twitter and GitHub. So, oh, okay. So it was it was Twitter, and I think I had it as as far back as 2008 because I remember Barack Obama followed me, and I thought that was really cool. And uh, Barack so, Obama anyways, followed the handle Envy. E N V. Yep. Um, Oh, so, ENV. And, okay, okay. ENV. Sorry. Yep. Yeah, okay, that's a little. Bit so, <laughs> to be honest, it was um, it was a little bit of a a rough handle to have because it's a really common programming variable. So, anytime someone on Earth uses at ENV, I would get a notification about about that piece of code. So, but it was pretty cool that it was um it was short. So, someone reached out. It was actually a Brazilian web hosting company, and they just reached out and said, "Hey, we're building this brand. We would love to, you know, acquire this stuff." the ENV name from for GitHub and Twitter. And so I did a little bit of research and I found out that it was a violation of Twitter's terms of service to sell a name outright because it's, it's like their platform. So I did some research and I found out that uh, CNN BRK, which is CNN's breaking news handle, somebody had owned it and CNN wanted to acquire it. So they set up a consulting agreement where he sort of consulted for them and they got access to that name. So that was the structure that 
I used with the hosting company. So I've kind of licensed uh, them my consulting services and they get to use the name as part of that. So you get paid in an ongoing way for this? Like they're paying you rent basically? <laughs> <laughs> um, sort of like that. It's it, it actually ended up just being a one-time payment for a lifetime of consulting. That is a great story and definitely, I think, useful. I mean, someone's going to want to uh, try that out one of these days. I wanted to ask how your legal team was there, Sean. You were like, hold on, we got a clarification from my legal team. I was like, who's this? Um, just, you know, the internet. Oh, okay. My legal like legit... team, the internet. I love it. <laughs> I, okay, small other related story. So I had, I also used to have the handle, my, which is my name, at Sean Robinson, S-H-A-U-N. And uh, I didn't use it. I kind of put one tweet on there that said, follow me on ENV, where I'm tweeting from. So there is an E! Entertainment News uh, Weekly, or E! Entertainment talk show host that has the same name. Her name is Sean Robinson. So she reached out to me and said, can I get this name from you? This was five or six years ago. And I said, sure, I'll sell it to you. And then the next day I woke up and, the, and Twitter had given the name to her. And so she, I think what happened is she kind of said, I'm a, I'm a celebrity and he's not using the name and he's trying to sell it to me, which is a violation. And so I lost the name. So with that experience in the back of my mind, I was like, no, 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 no. I, I cannot sell Twitter names, uh, but we'll look into a license agreement. So this happens wow. to like no one ever. And then like, <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah really glad we 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 went there um because we we just happened to see it uh we were taking notes in a meeting we had with dave cto correct i don't want to get the yes. titles wrong here yeah and uh we just taken this note where we had been trying to reach you uh, about talking about dc elixir last year and he mentioned something about you know you had you'd moved you'd gone into the van life and you'd sold your github handle and i was like <laughs> one two three <laughs> one of these things doesn't really this guy's got this guy's gone off the rails Amazing. Um, so speaking of going off the rails, um, we'd love to talk about Elixir. Sorry, I don't know if you guys were using Rails at any point in your life, <laughs> but we would love to know about your personal past to Elixir and how you sort of landed there, especially Torin. You talked about looking for a job in Elixir. So that's kind of great to hear. We'd love to know about your both of your experiences first time using it. Yeah, I mean, I can soak up some air in the room here. So my story goes a little bit further. So I had the ambition, the desire to be an Elixir developer. I obviously have been doing single page apps for many years, so nobody was going to look my way. But as usual, I was going to push through that. So I decided first, obviously, the network effect would help. And this was back when obviously you could go to a conference, meet some people. So I paid my own way to Lone Star Elixir. And I think this was actually the February 2019 Lone Star that I went to. And I just met a ton of people at this Lone Star. and. A lot of people sort of understood my story. It's something different, right? When you meet them in person, sort of get some idea of who you are. And that allowed me to get through the door a little bit more. But through a lot of those interviews, I met really companies I think were in some hyper growth, I would call it. Probably why they came to Lone Star to begin with, right? Looking to hire. And when somebody tells me that they're going to hire like 70 engineers that year, I sort of look at myself and say, like, do I want to be one of those 70? So I didn't end up taking any of those jobs, uh, but to help myself stand out further, I also decided like I should have a real project, something to prove to prove that I actually can build something. So I built this game called Elixir Match, and I started kind of talking about this and used it as an interview tool. And actually, Sean and I, I think when we got together, uh, we went through that as part of the pairing interview that we did at Legends. So really, it was just getting some experience with Elixir under my belt getting that in front of people, meeting people, and eventually getting some opportunities my way. And Sean, I guess, believing in me, the potential maybe. Sean? I believe in Torin. He's awesome. Yeah. Um, okay. A little bit about my background. So, so I think I started um, when I was younger, I used to, uh, I used to make programs for AOL. Like I'd be chatting on AOL and I would be building these little programs in, in Visual Studio, Visual Basic, I guess. And then one day I re remember learning like, oh, I can use this code to write web applications. And I figured out how to kind of hook up a database and stuff. And that kind of led me to, towards PHP because I was like, oh, you don't have to pay for this. It's free. VB was, you had to pay. So when I was a, kind of a teenager, I, I started working with WordPress and Expression Engine in, in PHP. And I kind of built a, a web development consultancy around those technologies. 
And then about 2014, I kind of got the startup bug. I got somebody reached out to me and said, do you want to join the startup? And I was, I was kind of like, yeah, th this seems really awesome. After having built, you know, one website after another, it seemed like a great idea to build kind of one product and that seemed really exciting. And at that startup, we chose Clojure. So that was kind of my foray into functional programming and especially kind of dynamic functional programming. So I spent a couple of years with Clojure and, uh, and kind of learning all this, the nice stuff that, you know, about functional programming, immutable data structures, concurrency, and those types of things. And the job after that was a Ruby on Rails shop. And it was, a, I remember just kind of missing functional programming when I was working back in Rails. I was uh, just kind of typical things that happen with Ruby. Ruby on Rails applications where you can kind of get into like a callback hell where you, you know, you say user.save and then hundreds of little calls go off and you're not sure what happened. And it's hard to sort of introspect and understand the system. And so then with Legends of Learning, uh, when, when, it, when we started off, we sort of chose with that experience kind of in my mind, we were looking at technologies and we chose to go very data driven and functional. So we, we started the application um, using SQL and and React, and we had this server in the middle that was PostgreSQL, it was called. And what it did was it it introspected SQL and automatically generated a GraphQL server so that basically you could just code in, in React and SQL. And so I kind of knew about Elixir just for, because I knew that it had some of the ergonomics of Ruby on Rails and then sort of a lot of the aspects of Clojure that make Clojure kind of a, a great functional programming language. So I kind of knew about Elixir, but when we when legends of learning was first being built we kind of didn't commit to any application stack we just used those we used react and sql and so it was kind of in the second year when we started having some scaling problems with those choices where we kind of knew we needed to introduce an application layer and i remember at first i was kind of i, I was like oh maybe we could use closure but closure is kind of notoriously people don't have a lot of experience with lisps and I think also Clojure as a community is very library focused and less framework focused. And so I think because of that, people end up, you know, kind of designing their own in-house framework for a company and it could look different from one company to another. So I think that's what was really attractive about Elixir for me, at least it was kind of like, oh, I get to use these concepts and technologies, functional programming, data, a dy dynamic language but I'm getting something that other developers are actually going to want to use and having sort of a battery batteries included framework like Phoenix that kind of pushed it over the edge of, of the other, the other choices. And um, I think it turned out to be a great choice because after we selected that, we started to get really great engineers like Torin who are specifically looking for Elixir. So it was at first, it was an open question of like, will we actually be able to hire for this language? That's not one of the main languages that, you know, you see out there. Um, and it turned out not only could we hire, but we were actually, it was a filtering mechanism to get really great people. Mm -hmm. That's something that we hear over and over again. When you were making that decision to go to Elixir, who else was in on that conversation and what was some of the pushback or, you know, you mentioned closure that you were thinking of. Did anybody throw up any other alternatives? I think we had narrowed it down to, we had narrowed it down to Node or Elixir. And just because we, we already had, we were, our friend was in, you know, in JavaScript and React, and then we had some node applications running on the back end. We, we had done some serverless stuff with Lambdas. And so we already had JavaScript kind of in our ecosystem. Um, so we were, cons we considered node as kind of our safe choice. Uh, and so then we had Elixir as kind of our, we'd like to do this, but we're not sure if it's too risky. And I, I think, you know, we, we, we looked at, we look at Rails and we look at, at Python. Um, but I think I was certainly very biased towards, uh, towards functional programming and towards just, you know, biting the bullet and using something that was a more modern, modern language like Elixir. We tried to, you know, make a systematic um, decision and identify the different criteria, like how easy would it be to hire? How easy is it to, to find resources? What if we get stuck? Um, and so we tried to lay out the criteria and I think at the end we just said, let's, let's just go with Elixir. I think it was at that time, it was myself, uh, Jeremy, who's one of our other uh, senior engineers and, uh, Jared, who, uh, 
he was sort of a an early engineer that worked with us and he was kind of a react front end specialist i think he was open to it as well and so we kind of there may have, may have been a couple other people at that time but we kind of got in, got in a room and just on the whiteboard just went through all the, these criteria and came out with okay we're going to we're going to start using elixir and uh, yeah and i can i can talk a little bit more about the actual strategy that we used to start introducing elixir into a running application if if you guys want uh, I, I do want to know about that. I've also got a question for Torn. And, and before I even get to that one, I want to know how big of an, a role Lambdas play in your architecture. I mean, that you mentioned that you had a few back then. Today, do they still play a role? No, they don't play any role today. Um, as I mentioned, we started with SQL, Postgres, and React on the front end. And then we had that PostgreSQL server in the middle. And the idea, this was kind of 20, this was 2016. And I think serverless was pretty hot at that time. Everybody was like, oh, do we even need servers? And so when we had something that came up, so the first example was we in our platform, we have thousands of game developers all over the world who build these mini games. And so they, we have a process where they kind of, it's like the back end of an app store. They log in and they can upload a version of their game and then it goes through a, a review process. So the first task that didn't really fit into that, you know, SQL back and forth, SQL to React flow was we need a service that can receive a zip file and unzip it and put it on S3 and then update the database. So we said, okay, well, for something like that, let's just use, let's build a Lambda. And the funny thing about that Lambda is the way it was coded is it would go to the database, find stuff that needed to be unzipped, unzip it and update the database. And then the next time that that row would no longer be unzipped. But if it didn't work, it, it would just keep looping. And so two years later, we realized the Lambda was still running and still trying to unzip. So it actually worked really well in that sense. Like it was, you know, it did not go down uh, even when we wanted it to, but we ended up moving away from sort of the serverless approach. I, I think we just lacked sort of a central way to manage those. I know there's frameworks out there like serverless and things like that, but going towards something like Elixir where we really had our own application stack that was sort of back into a monolith that ended up being a really productive choice for us. So we don't use, we don't have any serverless lambdas left anymore. I'm curious, how much did you spend on, uh, <laughs> on that Lambda? Yeah. On that Lambda doing absolutely nothing for two years. Probably a lot, a lot. <laughs> I, I think we were, we were benefiting from the AWS early stage startup credits. So we didn't, it didn't come up on our radar, but it was, literally for two years, unzipping the same files over and over, trying to upload them, failing, and then looping again. <laughs> so, Sunday, don't let us forget to ask how they moved from their old architecture to the Elixir architecture, because I do want to not forget about that question. But I want to ask Torin what it was like being hired by a company. Like, what was the hiring process for you at that point, Torin, and, and if it's changed at all since then? The hiring process, I think it was you know, not too different than your average hiring process. You know, they wanted to get to know me, uh, wanted to see me talk about some code. We didn't have like a sort of surprise whiteboard interview or anything like that. I was remote, so I was actually interviewing remote. And I basically met the two engineers at the time, Sean and Jeremy, paired up with them. And uh, what was kind of neat is since I had just recently done this game, they just said, hey, let's, let's see some code you've written in Elixir. And so I, I basically, by padding my own resume, <laughs> pulled this game up and went through it, which was kind of cool and got a chance also to meet Sean uh, and Jeremy in the process, get to know them as human beings, which was really cool. And what about now? Are you, I mean, you're still hiring. Have you changed the process at all as you've all become more comfortable in Elixir? I think we are not hiring now, but we are fundraising. And so... You know, we're kind of at the end of a, of a cycle of fundraising. And so, um, you know, our, our executives kind of try to keep that stuff away from us while we're working in. So I might be a little out of touch with, with what's going on, but I know that um, we do plan to raise money and we would use that money to hire and build our team, build our engineering team. What do you hope your team looks like if you're able to secure that? Um, maybe a couple more clones of Torin. And uh, uh, well, we have we have Torin, we have Robson, Jeremy. We just have some really great people, and um, we just have way more work. That's it's scoped out, it's ticketed, it's ready to go. Users want it. We just don't have enough people. 
So I think it would be some combination of more more junior, intermediate, and senior level people that would be able to to work on on those different parts of the system. Yeah, we always say that we need a few more Eric's. We could all use a few more Eric's. So totally get that uh, for sure. Um, do you still do you all still consider yourselves a DC based company? I'm just curious as a, a fellow DC resident. I, I think yes, although. So when the company started, we always had a two, three days in the office, two days remote setup. It was like Monday, Tuesday in the office, Monday, Tuesday, and Friday, and then Wednesday, Thursday were work from home days. But I think then when we started hiring engineers, we kind of realized just how much higher quality engineers we could get if we if we opened that up. And so I think Torin, were you our first, were you our first remote person? Yeah, guaranteed remote. I think yeah. And then today everyone's remote. So it's it's Torin in, in Iowa, Jeremy, I think is in Maryland, Robson is in Buenos Aires, and Hosh is in Arizona. And then I'm in Oregon and Dave's in Virginia. Amazing. So that's all the time zones. All the time yep, zones. Yep, all the time zones. That must be fun for whoever manages your calendars. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly Sean, because he has to get up at the crack to meet us all for stand-up. Mm, amazing. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm just interested in that because, you know, uh, last summer I was trying to identify Elixir jobs. I think at the time I didn't, I hadn't considered the idea of remote, you know, forever, just remote for now kind of thing. And I was looking for Elixir jobs and I was like, okay, well, there are two companies that use Elixir in DC. The one I just left and Legends. I don't think they're hiring right now. So I got to branch out somehow. It's always nice. I just always keep my my ear to the ground on on who's hiring for what, um, because, you know, here we, we try really hard to make sure that people who want to stay in Elixir for whatever reason can stay or can join in, you know, we want to make sure that people who are interested in Elixir have the ability to join in. So it's always good to know when those opportunities arise. So great to hear that when Torn was looking for a job in Elixir, he found one. I always love to hear those stories. I would say back then, it definitely was a bit of a a fight, you know, you, you had to really look, uh, and also just really groom the companies that were, because obviously if you're looking for your first shot at any new programming language, you probably, especially if it's out of state, like it is for me often, probably don't know that company. You don't know the hiring managers. You don't know the team. There's a lot of risk and obviously risk on both sides. You know, they don't know me either. So that's maybe just comes with the territory of languages that are younger, like Elixir is. Torn, you had some words for us about live view. <laughs> oh, dude, that last show, the one that came out today, uh, <laughs> dunking on live view saying like, well, yeah, we ran into a mess. I mean, I would actually be surprised if you guys picked up a live view project and it wasn't a mess just because it's new tech, right? Anybody picking that up has no idea what they're doing often. So I just wanted to step in, you know, lightly, softly defend live view a little bit. Well, so this is great. I want you to defend live view. Um, I think it was me. So first of all, a little bit of context for the audience. We're recording this on February 11th, 2021. It's probably going to come out in a few weeks. The episode that came out today was the episode with our president of Smart Logic, Gary Flicker. Live view comes up in the conversation. And I said, you know, I've already ran into like one mess in live view. And I, I won't mention the project. It's not even actually a Smart Logic project, but still, I'm not going to mention the project. I want to know from you, okay, yeah, it's a mess because it's a new technology. And people don't know how to architect new technologies. What's the solution here? Like, sell me on it. Sell you on it? Uh, I don't know. I, I would say, you know, I don't know the, the project you looked at, obviously, and I didn't look at the code. But I would say, you know, I've, I've built a few games with LiveView now. In fact, one of them I built over the Christmas holiday because we have some family that were not coming back uh, due to COVID. But we always play this fun game. Uh, kind of bicycle shedding game called president. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. You basically dump your hand and the first one to lose their hand is the president. And then you play another game and you continue to be either president VP or the lower tiered citizens. We'll put it that way. And so anyway, yeah, this fun president game, I built that in live view and it wasn't my first live view experience, uh, but this was one that uh, I had a good time with. And I think really it comes down to the programming model. So for me, 
when, you know, you guys are talking obviously on the show about running into some trouble or is live view production ready? My only feedback is just that if, if you look at the model and what Chris and that team has done, I think they've actually got a pretty good foundation there. I think there's still improvements and changes. So to Eric or whoever made the comment that like, Hey, we might wait for it to stabilize right there with you guys on production projects. But uh, I actually think live view is really productive. And that comes from somebody that my day job is the polar opposite where I'm writing react GraphQL and Elixir backends. And when I just drop into straight live view and I'm just working in Elixir, there's not this pivot foot over the boundary of client server that you often do when you're doing really rich client work. So, And maybe as another argument for live view, at least from my experience with it, um, I took uh, Roxio's live view course last okay. April with Bruce Tate and I got a more functional, like realistic view of how Elixir worked as a whole. I, I think that was probably more Bruce than it was Live View, to be honest. It was really, it was fun. It was easy to pick up, uh, even maybe for somebody who didn't know too much Elixir beforehand. Um, maybe the one downside of it is I fundamentally have less understanding of how Phoenix works in general. And I can't find resources on Phoenix now in the same way that you you look for something and you find it only for Live View because people are just so desperately trying to figure out how to do something in Live View. All the resources on the internet right now are for Phoenix Live View, and you can't look for something just for Phoenix because it's in the, the SEO. It's in the same name, so I don't know. I, I had a lot of fun working in Phoenix Live View during that class. I haven't gotten a chance to work with it since then. I've been playing around with the idea of doing something with it. I uh, just can't think of anything, but, you know, we'll see. But, yeah, it's it's interesting. You know, as with new, te new technology, it just takes a little time for adoption, but that's what we're, we're talking about today. So, fair points. Yeah, and I'll say, uh, what's wrong with just basic HTML? <laughs> and why can't every website just look like Craigslist? Eric is our resident Grinch when it comes to this. Oh, we've got a few of them. Sean, let's return to this question of the process of refactoring from your sort of old code base into an Elixir monolith. I am a huge fan of monoliths. I think I might have already mentioned that in this episode. Can you talk about that process and, uh, and, and just about the process of adopting Elixir? So I... Um... I think everyone in, who's worked in software, you kind of, you've either done the big rewrite yourself or you've learned not to do the big rewrite where you're kind of like, oh man, you know, now that I've built this system, I can see how to do it so much better, cleaner, new technologies, simpler, uh, but it's going to require me to kind of start over. And, and um, there's all sorts of horror stories about what happens when, you know, when you have a production app and then you start to like you try to rewrite and try to catch up and it's there's all sorts of hidden complexities and features and things like that that cause it to to often fail so i i remember having read this one page on martin fowler's website he's kind of like a like a prolific software engineer and, and writer and he has this page called the strangler pattern and it's kind of got this picture of like a tree with lots and lots of vines that's strangling another tree and so that was kind of the approach that we used so what we did was we started off with kind of a brand new Phoenix app. So what we did is we took, we made ecto schemas for our existing database tables. So that was kind of the first step. And that's one really nice thing about ecto, ecto schemas in particular, that you just give it the name of a table and it kind of doesn't matter if that table um, exists or, or if, it's, if it's new or existing, it will wrap it and you can, you know, you specifically add in the attributes that you want that schema to have. So it doesn't have to be the full set of attributes in the DB. But that was the first step we did. We wrapped all of our existing tables with Ecto schemas. And then we started uh, using, I think, XUnit to start writing tests. We, we didn't really have great test coverage before. So we kind of started like specking out our app using that. And we actually found bugs that way. And so over time, you know, that's, that's where we started. And so over time, we were able to kind of build up uh, confidence in how the app was working and get rid of some of the bugs. And then the other thing we did is so I mentioned we had that post GraphQL API. We started, instead of having our clients um, go directly to, the, to that API, we started proxying it through Phoenix. So it's like the API request would come into Phoenix and then Phoenix would pass it off. And so that gave 
pass it off to the API layer. And so by putting Phoenix in the middle, it let us start to get instrumentation and monitor those requests. We, we sometimes didn't even know um, what requests were coming in or how long they were taking. And I think the third thing we did was we, we mounted our React app inside of, we used Phoenix's build pipeline and kind of Webpack integration to build that app. So Phoenix kind of, all these little tools that Phoenix has, Ecto schemas, Ecto migrations, the build pipeline, and just a web, you know, full stack web framework, we were able to sort of strangle the rest of the application. So we started mounting it on, we started mounting different, creating different routes that would replace certain pages of the site. And just last week, I think about two, which is two years later, we finally deleted that old V1 API as we, as we called it. And so now we're 100% in this nice, clean Phoenix uh, monolith. Uh, Torin just finished porting our game developer portal into Phoenix and we just released that. And the game devs are super happy, uh, happy about it. And we have way less, I think, I think we're using only a few web servers, whereas before we, when we got to the height of our scaling problems, we were using like 15 or 20 of these API servers to do like wasted amounts of work. Um, so now we're much more efficient with, we're handling a lot more requests with a lot fewer servers and we have, we can do everything in Elixir with one stack. So I, I think that was a pretty cool, like I didn't know if it would work, but now having been through that, it's, it was really cool to see how you can basically replace a running production system with a better one without kind of taking on the risk of a, of a big rewrite. So just wanted to share that with you guys. That's awesome. Has there been any scaling up or down or any changes that you had to make to your system in the wake of COVID and more online learning? Yeah, I, there was a uh, auto scaling piece of tech, I guess you would call it, that is Phoenix driven, but Kubernetes probably actually does the work. So Phoenix, what we wanted to do was really get a metric about how many connected web sockets we have or sessions we have. And that would alert or give Kubernetes information to decide really what is the percentage of CPU on this box. And if you know all these boxes are at 50% or more CPU, we probably need to spin up a spot instance or another machine. So something we went through recently was the Elixir upgrade from 110 to 111. And there was an interesting change during that because we were using PubSub 1, obviously, the Phoenix PubSub. And during that migration to go to Phoenix 1.5, we had to upgrade to PubSub 2.0. And we were using this private API, Phoenix PubSub list local. And when you actually go look at the source, it's like, please don't use this in production. But it was actually a really handy way to get information or metrics about the local node, not the entire cluster. And so we use that information really just to determine, hey, should we scale up? And that's obviously very important to be on the local node, not the cluster in that case. Cindy, another one that comes to mind is we, we started using uh, TimeScale recently, TimeScale DB. So TimeScale is, a, is a, it's an extension of Postgres. And it has some additional features that make it so that when you have a lot of data, like lots of low level data points that you can have, they call it continuous view, where it sort of rolls up the data and stores the rolled up data so that when you query the rolled up data, it's really fast. And we just got to a scale where we had so much, so much, so many of these low level data points that when someone queried a lot of them, it just was really, really slow. Like one of our views got to something like 60 seconds and then it timed out and and so what was the, the way this relates to Phoenix and Elixir is that Ecto just worked because it's just Postgres. We were able to wrap our timescale DB tables and views with Ecto schema and everything just works. We can use Ecto queries on those schemas. And even though timescale is doing all this magic under the hood to roll up um, individual data points into aggregates, um, it just works like normal in Phoenix. So I think that's pretty cool. Nice. Torin, we do have a question specifically for you because Sean has been there since the beginning. Um, when you joined, was there anything that you had to tear apart or refactor, as we say? Interesting question. A lot of the game uh, front end code and the tooling underneath of it uh, was kind of aged. And so over time, those things were basically thrown out and rewritten. A lot of that was more on the React side. So I'm trying to think of any Elixir that I actually rewrote. I don't think so, honestly. Torrance being humble, the whole code base was trash and he's been writing beautiful clear code as we've been upgrading uh, parts of the system. Maybe we should have asked Sean from the beginning. <laughs> we we were real really story. hoping he would just come, he would just savage. What he's like, you have no idea. No, I'm just kidding. You know, we've talked a lot about, you know, legends in general and 
you, both of your paths to Elixir, a lot of our listeners are people who are looking to be hired into an Elixir role or are hoping to bring Elixir to their company. What kind of advice would you give to them from either situation to help them reach those goals, seeing as you've both kind of done that at some point? Maybe there's a lesson from that that strangler pattern that you know you don't have to convince your company to make a wholesale switch if you can just deploy something something that adds value then and you can get people using that it's it still works with the same database so you can you could build something off of a database that you already have to show value or you could you could build it for a piece of this, for a piece of your existing application so i think that that could be could be one way it doesn't have to be this big you know architectural shift it can happen incrementally so that's one that comes to mind. What, what do you think, Torin? Yeah, I think my uh, useful information here would just come for people seeking or saying, how do I get my first Elixir job? And the two roads that I know that, you know, obviously just worked for me, but may help other people would be first, you know, get your hands into the tech that you're trying. So if you're trying to get an Elixir job, actually write some code. Don't just show up at the interview and say like, hey, I'd really like to work here. Uh, I just haven't taken the initiative. Isn't that great? <laughs> you obviously want to put in some some effort. And I think building something, get the thing all the way out to production on the web and show it to people. Um, in my case, the Elixir match game that I built, I literally sent that link out to people said, check this out. Is it cool? Okay, it's cool. You want to see the source? I also open source it. Go check that out. Gives people an instant path to learn more about me, my coding style and ask questions. If you don't do that, you can't really set yourself apart. Uh, the second thing, this is might be a little bit more narrow for people, but you know, if you can actually speak at a local meetup, just about something you learned, it doesn't have to be some huge open source release. Just start hacking into Elixir and go speak about what you learned. It can be really simple. I tried to do this before I even started my job search to kind of pad my blog. Because in a way, blogging, kind of like speaking, is a way to about about writing about what you've learned. So I basically spent 30 days where I tried to blog something every single day that I had learned in Elixir. And I did this while I was reading a couple Elixir books. So a lot of it seems like it really comes out of the chapters I was reading. But I was trying to really get through this and get it into my mind as I wrote it down. So if you can communicate clearly about something you're learning, that goes a long way. So whether you're speaking or writing. That's a great answer. One more fun question before we let you go here. What are each of your favorite games out of the Legends of Learning collection? Funny enough, I I just spend too much time with this game. So I don't know if favorite's the right word or just like comfort. You know, I'm very comfortable with this game called Miss Rose. And it's like a, a, yeah, a science game about climates. And I don't know, I'm, I'm really partial to that one. But I think another really fun game on the math side is uh, Newton's pool. And it's kind of like a interesting physics based game where you bounce almost like if you're playing pool, but on HTML, you basically kind of pull back and watch the ball react to all these other things in the game and then try and get it into a hole to advance to the next level. So both of those are high on my list. I know Sean though, he's, he's probably knows all 2000 games by heart. So every single one of them, I, I can speed run them. Oh, just kidding. Um, I think one of my favorites is the, it's called the tale of curious nail. And, um, this is an instructional game. So the instructional games kind of teach the curriculum. And then we have other games that are more like question and kind of assessment games. So this is one that really teaches it's in the category of, um, I think it's, I think it teaches about, let's see. So it's the description is nail. The curious snail helps you observe and learn about patterns of objects in the sky, day, night cycles, and the seasons. Uh, at the end of the game, students can use various tools to make observations on their own or guided by the teacher. So yeah, I just think it's got some cute artwork that kids really like. Wait, so this is teaching like cosmology or when you say objects in the sky, you mean like planetary bodies or clouds? It's about objects in the sky. So it's it's in the category of uh, the sun, moon and stars. Uh, oh patterns gosh. of apparent patterns of apparent motion is the name of the the unit. That is so lit. I love that. I got to get in though and actually plug because I think it may be a little confusing. I want to make the distinction, but also plug this game. That is, we have these 2000 mini games that Sean mentioned that indie developers make and obviously they're instructional and assessment styles and things, but we actually have our own game that is in the classroom and it's actually a really fun card game and you can build your own deck. It kind of reminds me of like a really 
you know, light version of Magic the Gathering or something where you actually stack your deck and you play these enemies. And obviously the questions that come up that are related to the subject, so math or science. But when you get those questions right, it sort of buffs the play. So you either, you know, buff your card, it does more damage, or you maybe get more cards in your hand. And to be quite honest, that's my favorite game. Uh, we designed that one ourselves and the kids play it uh, at home as well. And they can actually progress through all the grades playing that game at home without a teacher or a parent, which is kind of cool. So do you have any games that teach computer science fundamentals? I wish that would be nice. Not yet, but we've gotten a lot of interest from kids about that. And it's, they want to learn how to build games, which mm. is kind of meta. We need some games that will teach how to build games. Mm. Um, but yeah, just to plug what Torin was plugging, but it's called Legends of Learning Awakening and uh, it's available on the web and also now in the iOS store. And it, yeah, iOS store. That is so cool. I just want to share a story because it's kind of relevant. We go in to do Hour of Code every year. and I mean, you're basically sitting there helping kids to understand like super basic program concepts, loops, functions, variables, that kind of thing, which I think is actually so basic that we should be teaching it like at the same time as you teach basic reading concepts, because I, I don't know why you wouldn't <laughs> um, other than anyway. But there was one little girl there who didn't speak any English. But this girl could crank code and she embarrassed everyone in that class it was she put them all to shame and the craziest thing was that she was just zoned in like she didn't need any help she just completely ignored everything going on around her well everyone else is like you know these are little kids they're like six seven years old they're goofing off and you know barely getting it done but she was cranking and it, it just always struck me that like man take this girl out give her a macbook Get her, get her cranking on some on some websites and put her to work because I mean we need we need more people with that kind of focus anyway. No, I know that um, I was actually doing some volunteering last summer with a local comp local uh, bunch of companies that kind of volunteer this thing Tech Journey where kids come in and we even did it during COVID through Zoom and I had a a girl this was a little bit older this was like eight ninth grade. So a little bit older, but I know you're I know the feeling you got a couple of kids messing around on Zoom and then you got the one person. And she was a beast. Like she didn't need any help. She's like doing the full demo. She's asking super deep questions, like way beyond the level of this talk. And it was just really impressive. And it's like at the end of those, you're you like, the level this of is... this talk. I just mean, sorry, the, the level, like we go through a bunch of games in that session that I was working on. And it's just like, what level are you on? Cause we have not even approached the subject and you already yeah. sort of presumed it. And it's okay. just kind of really impressive. So I love that when you have the yeah. standout student that is just, you know, ACE material wrecking. So that's cool. Yeah. And it's all, it's like one, you know, cause I noticed that in the class, there was a few that were like good that were helping the other students. And then there were a few that were really bad or not even paying attention. And then there's the whole middle, but then there's one who's just cranking. And I'm like, that little girl's a prodigy. Get her out of here. Get her, get her into some, I don't know, special class or something, you know, special class. Okay. Anyway, I got to get off this topic before I say something real <laughs> stupid. All right. Uh, any, we'd like to give you the final word of the episode. So if you have any plugs or asks for the audience, shameless self-promotion, the time is yours. Uh, why don't we start with Sean and let Torn close up? I don't have any plugs, but I do want, did want to thank you guys. Um, yeah, Justice, this is a, this is our th my third time meeting you. I, we met, we had a drink in a bar once, and then I saw you kind of hosting the Elixir Conf, and you did an incredible job. Thank you. And um, and Sunday, I know you've been work, uh, organizing the DC Elixir meetup, and uh, and yeah, I so I just really wanted to say uh, on behalf of all the Elixir people, thank you guys for for all the community work you're doing. Yeah, I want to say also like Sean. A lot of this stuff you obviously do for the agency, the work that you do, but in a sense, it's also growing the Elixir ecosystem. It's, it's growing the interest. Uh, and that's, I think, really important. So I wanted to thank you. My only shameless self-promotion, no money tied to this product at all, is this company called Meeting Owl. And I think I actually heard about it on your podcast a way long time ago, actually. But if the world returns to some version of normal-ish for tech and you find yourself as the only person in the room on a call and there's 50 other people and you can't see who they are, you don't know who's talking and you're like, gosh, isn't there tech out there that solves this? Well, there is. And I bought it and I brought it to Legends when I started. And it was amazing. While everyone was still in the office, like Sean, during the meeting, you know, Sean starts talking on the left side of the table. It will actually zoom in on Sean 
And so me at home in Iowa, I was actually able to see Sean. You just feel a little bit closer to the team. And obviously people are more remote today, but if you return to this hybrid model, the, the meeting out, it's just really awesome. So I love that product. <laughs> and they sent me a shirt. So they're huge fans of promotion, I guess, shameless or otherwise. That is awesome. Thank you both so much. That's it for this episode of Elixir Wizards. Thank you again to our guests, Sean Robinson and Torin Billups from Legends of Learning. Thanks to my co-host, Sunny Mint, and my producer, Eric Ostrich. Once again, I am Justice Epen. Elixir Wizards is a smart logic podcast. Here at Smart Logic, we're always looking to take on new projects, building web apps in Elixir, Rails, and React infrastructure projects using Kubernetes and mobile apps using React Native. We'd love to hear from you if you have a project we could help you with. And don't forget to like and subscribe on your favorite podcast player. Help us climb those charts. You can also find us on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. So add us on all of those. And join us again next week on Elixir Lizards for more on Adopting Elixir. Elixir.